morning and, uh, and welcome to uh, Community Church. We are so glad that you are here uh, with us this morning. We hope that you had a, you had a good Thanksgiving, whatever, uh, whatever you ended up doing. Uh, it probably looked a bit different this year than it has in years past, but we hope that you were still able to, uh, to enjoy that time and to take some time uh, to, to think about and be thankful for the things that, uh, that you have uh, in this life. My name is Joe Aronson. I'm the site pastor here uh, at New City, and it, it really is a privilege and an honor to be here uh, with you this morning as we continue in this series, From Rubble to Redemption. Uh, we've been in this series for a little while now, uh, where we are looking at the minor prophets. Uh, the minor prophets aren't uh, minor because they're less important. It's not like the minor leagues in baseball. Um, it's just because they are shorter books, except for last week when Pastor Tommy had to talk about uh, Zechariah, which is one of the most challenging uh, minor prophets, and he did a really, really great job. And so if you, uh, if you missed that, make sure you go back and watch that. And if you did not uh, tell him that he did a great job, Make sure you send him an email or a Facebook message or whatever that may be uh, to encourage him in that way. Uh, we are continuing in this series, and we're looking at the prophet Joel this morning. So if you have a Bible, whether it's physical or, or digital, I encourage you to turn there. Um, we normally have been going through and looking at the entire book uh, and kind of seeing this theme that has emerged, where there's been this, uh, this rubble that the prophet comes in and talks about that is all around in the nation of Israel, that they have really just done a number on their, uh, on their society and their faith has been neglected and the prophets call them back to, to repair those things. They call them to, to repent, to turn around and to turn back to God and fidelity to uh, the things that he has called them to do and then what God will promise to do in response. And we see this th same theme in the book of Joel, but this morning, I wanted to take a little bit of a, a different approach to this. And so uh, we are going to do an overview of this book, but we're going to invite our friends at the Bible Project to come in and share with us that, uh, that overview. Um, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to look at this, uh, this video from the Bible Project, and then we'll, we'll jump into a specific passage within the book of Joel here in just a moment. So we'll be back in just a moment. The Book of the Prophet Joel. It's a short collection of prophetic poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Joel is unique among the prophets for a few reasons. First of all, there's no explicit indication of when this book was written. It's most likely the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin, but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings, and his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedies of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme in the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophets saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here in chapters one and two, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter one is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time, the locusts are being sent against Israel. 
And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer. And then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts, but he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes, and Joel says, the day of the Lord, it's dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how? To rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your God. In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent, because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoting here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts, and we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now, up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment, and that with the God of mercy, there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God's spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they can truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord, when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess it, and about how all of that leads us to hope that God will one day defend defeat evil in our world, but also inside of us, and bring his healing presence to make all things new. And that's what the book of Joel is all about.
They do a much better job of the overview than I could have ever done in six minutes, so um, we're glad to have them uh, as, as a resource that's available to us. And as, as we kind of saw in their overview, um, we see these themes of rubble, repair, and redemption come to the surface. It is, it is very much present within the book of Joel. And, and one of the keys to understanding this kind of formula that we've, we've seen in the prophets over and over again, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, is that what the prophets are doing when they come onto the scene and begin to preach and teach to the people of Israel is they're not coming in and saying anything new. They're coming in and they're taking the promises of God from the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and the Torah and applying them to their current circumstance. So God had promised that if they were disobedient, if they committed idolatry and they turned away from him, that there would be certain consequences that would occur. And so what they're doing is they're saying these are the consequences that we are going to experience because that's what God has promised. So for example, a few weeks ago we talked about Babylon and how Babylon is, the prophets look around and they see the idolatry in Israel and then they see Babylon, this giant nation, this superpower that seems to be looming outside their door and they say Babylon is going to come and overtake us. They're going to come and they're going to overtake us and it's not just going to be a political victory, rather this is God. God's judgment on us because of our disobedience. And so they go, the people of Israel end up going into exile and they're taken away from the promised land as a consequence of their disobedience. And within this context, something really interesting starts to happen with the prophets. Yes, they're still talking about the things that God has promised, but what they, they start to shift their focus a bit from the, the immediate to something that God is going to do in the future. He's, they start to talk about how God is going to establish a new type of relationship with his people, a new covenant that is different from the covenant that they're experiencing now that's conditional, that's based upon how good they are or are not being, how, how, how much fidelity they do have or how much infidelity that they are bringing to their relationship with God. The prophets start to talk about a day that is coming that God is going to shift that relationship from being works-based to being one that is grace-based. And so I want to look at, and you can keep your finger in the book of Joel, but I want to look at a few other passages just to, to highlight this. And so the first one I want to look at is Ezekiel chapter 36. So Ezekiel is writing during the time of the Babylonian exile. The people of Israel have been taken away from their homeland, and they're in a foreign land amongst foreign gods, and they desperately desire to go back to their homeland. And Ezekiel comes and he he gives a this is one of the major prophets it's a longer book but one of the things that he says he says this in in starting in verse 26 about this promise of what God is going to do in the future. He says, I, God, will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel is talking about this future day when God is going to take the hearts of stone that his people have, their hard hearts, and he's going to replace it with a heart of flesh, one that is, one that is, is, is sympathetic and one that desires to do what God desires for them to do, so much so that he will cause his people to walk in his statutes. The things that he desires, his people will actually do and and walk in. We see another one of these passages in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah is writing as the people of Israel are taken into exile. And so, but he's talking about this, this future thing that God is going to do. He starts in verse 31 of chapter 31. He says, 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new type of relationship. Not like the covenant, like, not like the relationship that I made with their fathers on the day when I brought them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother or sister, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I am forgiving their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more." Jeremiah is talking about this future date when God is going to shift their relationship, where God is going to establish a new type of relationship, a new covenant in which he will forgive their iniquities and remember their sin no more. Everyone from the greatest to the least will know God. And that brings us back to the book of Joel in chapter 2. So in this background, within this context, Joel is teaching and preaching. And he says this in chapter 2, starting in verse 28. He says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show the wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So these prophets begin to, not just looking back and looking at their immediate context, but they begin to see this pattern. They begin to see this pattern that the people of Israel are failing over and over and over again. That God is continuing to give them chance after chance and sends prophet after prophet. And maybe there's a bit, a little bit of a, a revival that happens and, and people turn their hearts to God for a bit, but inevitably it fades away. And so the prophets begin to talk about this future day where God is going to establish this new covenant that won't be based upon their works because they can't do it. It won't be based upon them keeping this set of rules because they have proven that they just continually fail. This new covenant won't be based upon behavior or adherence to the commandments, but upon God doing a new thing, a new work within his people. Something that will, will cause their sins to be forgiven. That will put the law, put his commandments on their hearts. Not just having it be something external that they do, but someone that they are. Causing his people to watch, walk in their statues. Giving them a new heart and filling them with the Holy Spirit. So we fast forward several hundred years and then there's this baby that's born in this manger. And this baby grows up and he begins to say some really incredible things. His name is Jesus. And he begins to talk about how he has come to restore the people of Israel. How to, to bring sight to the blind. That the, the captives will be set free. And then he ends up being crucified on a Roman cross placed in a tomb, and three days later is resurrected. And then he, he ascends back into heaven. And he says, it's better for me to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit back to you. And that brings us to the book of Acts. I promise this connects to the book of Joel. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, the disciples, were all together in one place. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And the divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they, they, be, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, in other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the, the disciples are waiting in this room because that's exactly what Jesus had told them to do. Wait for the helper, for the spirit to come and to guide you in what you are to do next. And suddenly the spirit comes and, and fills the disciples and they begin to speak in other languages. And we continue in verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of the multitude, and this, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they're bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. And they're amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And then he lists a bunch of people, a bunch of different areas within the ancient world that these people are from. And so what we have is the Spirit comes and indwells his, the, the disciples. They begin to speak in other languages. And all these different people that are already in Jerusalem show up because there's this big hub of blue that's happening. And there's this big rushing, like, is everybody okay? What is happening? And then these blue-collar Galileans begin to speak to these other people in Mandarin and in French and in Latin and in Egyptian dialects. And everybody's like, what in the world is happening? How is this possible? They're amazed and perplexed, starting in verse 12, and saying to one another, what does this mean? What are we supposed to do with this information? But others mocked, saying, they are filled with new wine. So they hear all these people that are speaking in other languages, and some people are like, what is happening? And other people are like, they're just drunk. It's so like, just whatever. They're like, this is just total and complete nonsense. And then Peter stands up, and he addresses them, all these people that are here. He stands up, and he gives the very first sermon. He says, no, they're not drunk. It's too early. It's only 9 a.m. Nobody gets drunk at 9 a.m., but rather what you are experiencing is prophecy being fulfilled. He says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk. As you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he quotes from the book of Joel, chapter 2. And this will sound very familiar. He says, this is what you are experiencing. As Joel said, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. On your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens and above, and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is why... We're taking a little bit of a detour from the book of Joel, because if we're going to appropriately understand the book of Joel, we have to figure out what the New Testament authors think the book of Joel means. If we want to understand the book of Joel, we have to look at how it's used in the New Testament. And what Peter does here with this passage in Joel is saying, you're experiencing this in real time. God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. 
And the Spirit is now living inside of all people who come to faith in Jesus. Not just a subgroup of God's people for a certain period of time. God's prophecies, are, Joel's prophecies are coming to fulfillment in your very midst. Because God always keeps his promises. This is several hundred years later. Joel comes and he says, this is what God is going to do, looking forward toward the future. And then Peter is saying, you're experiencing it. That day that Joel talked about, you are experiencing it. And then he goes on and he, he says some very powerful and profound things. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, for it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he quotes from the book of Psalms, saying that this passage from the book of Psalms has been fulfilled in Jesus. He continues and says, Brothers, I, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, to the place of the dead, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter stands up, and he gives this magnificent sermon after the church has just been born. And he says, this Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies in the Old Testament. This Jesus is the culmination of the story of God. This Jesus is the culmination of the story of Israel. Jesus has come and he has been the one to shift the covenant, to shift the relationship that we have with God. It's no longer based upon what we do and how good we are or how bad we are. It's based upon the grace on the, and the work of God through Jesus. The forgiveness of sins, the future resurrection of the body that Jesus is the first fruits there of. This story is so giant. This story is so powerful and profound as the whole thing, the entirety of the cosmos, culminates in the person and work of Jesus. And sometimes I think we lose a bit of the sight of this. When we look at, for example, the book of Joel, and we stay within the parameters of the book of Joel, we have to understand that this story is connected. That there's this, there is this overarching story that is being told through the scriptures. That Christianity is not just quippy sayings and quotable Bible verses. It is the epic story of God. So don't dumb down God's work to a few coffee mug statements. Understand that, that God is the one that is directing all of human history toward its conclusion. That we are a part of God's story. 
That as Peter testifies about this risen Christ, this Jesus who was delivered up to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, we get to proclaim that same message. We get to experience that same message. We are a part of God's story as he is making all things new. One more place I want to go very quickly is Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24. Jesus has been crucified, placed in the tomb, resurrected three days later, and he appears to his disciples. And he begins to teach them about a lot of things that they didn't understand. And starting in verse 44, he says, Then he said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, to all flesh, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. What Jesus is teaching them in this passage is that this entire book is about him. That as we read the book of Joel, one of the questions that we have to ask is, where's Jesus? Where, how does this point me toward Jesus? Because this whole thing points toward Jesus. It is one big story that is all about Jesus. We, you and I, right here, right now, in this room, we are living the fulfillment of Joel's prophecies. This is so incredibly powerful when we start to understand that it's not even just the story of Israel, but the, the entirety of creation was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and through Jesus. That he is at the very center of everything that we know. He is at the center of all of the mysteries of the universe. Jesus is the very center and is the very purpose of all of creation. And so Peter stands up and he gives the sermon. That's what he begins to tell these people about all of these who will hear from all of the different corners of the world. And some of them begin to understand like, oh my goodness, this is, this is incredible. What, what are we supposed to do? I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, Peter, and this is making so much sense to me. What are we to do? That's exactly what they ask. Now when they heard this, this is verse 37 in Acts 2. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. This has this prophetic tone to it that we've seen throughout this series. As the prophets show up and say, repent, look at the rubble that is around you. Look at the rubble that is your life. You need to repair this. You need to repent and turn back to God. Not just change your behavior, but change your mind about who God is. Change your mind about who the center of this story is because it's not you. You are not the center of this story. Jesus is the center of this story. 
And so some of you might be hearing this, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time. You're saying, what am I supposed to do with this? Joe, how am I supposed to apply this? I would say the same thing that Peter says. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have not been baptized as a believer, come and talk. And let's figure out a time for that to happen. If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus, come and talk. Let's do that today. Maybe today is the day that, that everything clicks, that you start to understand that you're absolutely right, like that Jesus is the center of this whole thing. And I have not been living that way, that that is not a, an adequate reflection of my life, where you finally get it, that Jesus is at the center. Because if we're going to understand the book of Joel, we have to understand what Jesus has come to do. And the beauty is that Joel teaches us about what Jesus is going to come and do because he is at the very center of this whole story. He is the redemption from the rubble. So I'm going to invite the worship team up and they're going to lead us in a, in a song of response and it might not feel like it, but today is actually the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, Advent is a, is a time within the church calendar where, where we set aside dedicated time to prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus, to celebrate the gift of God that comes to us through Jesus on Christmas. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing that we have done is we put together a series of videos that we would encourage you to utilize as you participate in this Advent season with us. And those will be available this afternoon. And so whether it's your, just you or you and your family or you and your roommates or, or your community group that you can utilize to see and to focus your heart on Jesus. To remember that this season as we move forward into Christmas is not just about lights. It's not just about presents. It's not just about being around family and listening to Christmas songs. All those things are good. But to remind us that Jesus is at the center. And as we come into this Christmas season, my prayer is that we would start to see more and more these connections. That Jesus is not just show up out of the blue. That he is the culmination of the entirety of the story of human history. That we need to calibrate ourselves so that he's not just the center of human history, but so that he is the center of our story. To see this grand narrative that God is writing and how Jesus is at the center of it and how he invites us to be a part of his story. To come and to find life and to find life abundant. So let's stand and let's pray together as we prepare to sing. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your work in our lives. God, we are thankful for your never-ending pursuit of us. God, we desire to be your people and for you to be our God. And we declare that that is the truth this morning, that you are God and there is no other. God, we acknowledge that we are selfish creatures that we look toward our own interests and our own desires, and we, we want to be the center of our own story, but God, we pray that you would be the center. God, that we pray that you would help us to calibrate ourselves, to put you in your rightful place as king of our lives, as king of our hearts, as, as king of the universe. God, we give you our very selves as a living sacrifice. Thank you for walking with us through this life and all of the, the, the trouble and joy that we experience. 
We are so thankful for your faithfulness and for your grace. God, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.